to open the conference, and I'm super excited about this talk, it's going to be called Human After All, Why Robots Will Never Outcreate Their Creators. Um, sounds like an answer, not a question, but I'm intrigued to see if I can be convinced. We have Carly Kine, she's the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, an independent research and deliberative body with a mission to ensure data and AI work for people and society. She's a human rights lawyer, she's a leading authority on the intersection of technology policy and human rights, and Carly's advised industry, government, and non-profit organisations on digital rights, privacy, and data protection, as well as also, of course, corporate accountability. Please join me in giving Carly a huge round of applause for opening today's conference. Hi everyone. Um, well, I hope you're not too disappointed you've come to a technology conference and you have a data protection lawyer starting things out, um, but hopefully I uh, won't be too dry and boring. I did... Uh, pull somewhat of a fast one on you by calling my talk, uh, will robots, or why will robots will never outcreate their creators, because in fact, I'm not really going to talk about that, but what I wanted to acknowledge was uh, this kind of problematic preoccupation with these types of questions. Um, those of you in the room here who work in the field of artificial intelligence, um, uh, know that this is kind of a distraction from a lot of the real questions. And we do see the media and the public discourse getting a little um, hung up in questioning, you know, will, will robots take over the world? What will it look like when we have flying cars? These type of kind of fantastical projections of the future. And I think that that says something about this strange face of technological development we're in at the moment where um, uh, from a public's perspective, we're waiting for the, the superhuman AIs to turn up and all the while very real advances are being made in more um, perhaps mundane or behind the scenes AI applications. And um, as a society, we're not really sure how to talk about it. So we end up asking questions like, will robots replace us? Will they um, outcreate their creators? Can they ever be truly creative, etc.? And undoubtedly, these are important questions to consider. But they can also act as a distraction, and they can obscure how data and AI are changing our world now, and how AI is mediating our relationships with each other, between citizens and the state, and between consumers and, and companies right now. The proliferation of data-driven technologies and autonomous systems into every part of our lives is already changing our world. And it's having deep societal impacts that we understand very little about. I'm gonna talk about just a few of them now. Advancements in computer vision technology have enabled the birth of facial recognition technology, which is increasingly accurate in uncontrolled environments such as public streets at events and on CCTV footage. Um, this technology may have really positive applications, but it has also genuinely concerning ethical failings, particularly because it simply doesn't work very well in many respects. It's worse at identifying women and ethnic minorities than it is at identifying white men. But there are even more important ethical implications in a future in which this technology works really well what does a future in which people can be uniquely identified everywhere they go look like? What does it mean for anonymity? Creativity has always thrived in anonymity. Authors using pen names, French electronic DJs wearing helmets like you saw from my first slide. What impact will persistent identification have on artists and people who create and on progressive movements and on radical thought and on resistance? Uh, online and offline. And facial recognition technology enables us to start to think about that future. It's potentially uh, a possible future. And we really need to think now about whether or not that's the society we want to build. The ability to automate analog processes means that many, many jobs will be at risk of automation and thus redundancy. In Britain alone, one and a half million workers are at high risk of losing their jobs, according to the Office of National Statistics. A quarter of all supermarket checkout assistants have disappeared, sorry, the people haven't disappeared, the roles have disappeared in the last eight years. A quarter of all supermarket uh, checkout assistant roles. 
that's not only an economic problem, that's a social problem. How do we need to redefine social purpose and meaning outside of work and jobs? How do we ensure that people have the dignity that they derive from their profession? And how do we ensure that they have a safety net as well? In the ONS's estimation, 70% of high-risk jobs are held by women. 40% of them are held by people whose educational attainment was GCSE or lower. How do we need to think about education and how do we ensure that AI doesn't disadvantage those who already learn, earn less and suffer from challenges to social mobility? How should we think about taxation and the redistribution of wealth in our society? If the fourth industrial revolution is decimating traditional forms of income and diminishing jobs, it will also, perversely, limit taxation income by the state, which is necessary to provide workers who lose their job to automation with a safety net. If tech companies benefiting most from this AI revolution are able to escape um, fair taxation, this is particularly problematic. So how should we value data-driven industries and how can we reflect that valuation in modern taxation rules and ensure that the wealth that the AI revolution is going to bring to our society is equally distributed. Equity and equality are key social values at risk by the growth of AI. This is in part due to the data-heavy bent of current AI exploration, which means that AI systems are built on top of existing data sets and, and existing bias data sets and therefore replicate those biases. At the same time, the digital divide means that 11% of Britons aren't even online and often they hail from particularly vulnerable groups, which means they're not accounted for in data sets and those data sets are forming the foundation of AI systems. So what does AI mean for difference and for pluralism? Because of the trend in re reinforcement learning currently, do we risk the continual iteration of systems which create homogeneity rather than encouraging pluralism? I'm not here to warn you of the horrors of AI or paint a dystopian vision of the future. AI has immense potential to make our lives easier, more prosperous, more convenient, more environmentally friendly. Those of you who work in artificial intelligence do not need to convince me of that. Um, and in this context, the conversation we'll be having in the next two days over AI and creative industries is really instructive because it's about exploring new ways to think about AI and how it can bring immense benefit to the creative industries. Just as AI can act as a collaborator for artists, for example, it has immense potential, for example, in the field of medical sciences, where medical professionals can work alongside robotics in complicated surgeries. And it can also open up new idea spaces and challenge us to think in different ways. The, the incredible opportunities in this respect were most clearly demonstrated in the famous Go match between Lee Sedol and DeepMind's AlphaGo. 37 moves into the second game of the match, AlphaGo made a move that no human being would ever make, and it left the contender absolutely flummoxed. AlphaGo went on to win the game, but two games later, Lee Sedol made a similar, similarly out of left field move, something that a human wouldn't normally make, and it caused him to win the game. We can assume that his experience in game two helped him think differently about what moves to make. And so if we imagine the application of this mindset that AI enables into other fields, such as medicine, but other, other areas of invention or exploration, there's incredibly exciting opportunities. So AI can have immense benefits. But it is critical that we become more sophisticated about how we talk about it and more granular in our conversations about how to integrate it into work, commerce, and our public services, rather than defaulting to fanciful discussions or esoteric debate. So that's why we've established <coughs> the Ada Lovelace Institute, which has a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. We're building evidence about the impacts of AI on society, and we're convening diverse voices to create a shared understanding of the ethical issues uh, that arise, and we're informing policy and practice to ensure we're building good societies that respect and reinforce the social values of agency, solidarity, diversity, and equity. At, at Ada, we're evidence-led, so we work with academics and researchers and scientists to develop empirical evidence about the benefits and disadvantages of AI for people and society. 
We're policy facing, meaning we develop workable solutions to inform policymakers and practitioners about how to ensure technological developments are consistent with social values. And most importantly, we're people-centered, which means we see ourselves as playing a critical role in engaging the public in complex discussion about how to navigate ethical issues and where to strike the trade-offs and compromises around AI and data-driven technologies. To give you one example, in 2020, we'll be convening a public deliberation initiative of 60 members of the public um, in two places in the UK. And those 60 members of the public will get together over a three month period, six times, and they will talk about facial recognition and other biometrics technologies and get a chance to really debate what do we think the benefits of these technologies are? What are their disadvantages? How should they be governed? How should they be used by the public sector and the private sector? And then they'll make recommendations to the government and to, to the private sector afterwards about how to proceed with that incredibly controversial piece of technology. When it comes to the ethics of AI and data, I think there's no more important question than what do people expect? What do they want and what do they deserve? And this is where the creative industries have so much to contribute. It's through creativity, art, film, and fiction that we can really start to understand and explore the impacts of technological change. The Royal Society a couple of years ago started to convene a conversation about how narratives inform the development of AI and policy around AI, and how they help us imagine the impacts of technological change. Um, and they produce this report, Portrayals and Perceptions of AI and Why They Matter. And in that, they explore how, uh, how the creative industries historically have informed the development of technology and, and uh, societal attitudes towards technology. So one thing that the creative industries can do is help us imagine future technologies. The way Star Trek helped inventors and scientists imagine the potential for remote communications. We know that science fiction has always played an incredibly central role in pushing scientists and designers and engineers to think about the future possible. But the creative industries can also help us think about the ethical impacts of technology and perhaps even to mitigate some of the negative ethical impacts of technology. So almost 20 years after it came out, Minority Report is still an essential reference point for the dangers of predictive policing. And in my day-to-day -day work, I hear policymakers and technologists referencing it. In other fields outside of AI, we've seen film and television and fiction and design all being central to changing social attitudes and even policies. In terms of attitudes, we can all see most recently how TV shows like The Handmaid's Tale or perhaps a bit further back, the movie Philadelphia, which changed attitudes towards gay couples in America. Some particular examples include the Belgian film Rosetta, which followed the life of a poor Belgian teenager and her struggles to find and hold on to a job. It led to Belgian policymakers adopting Rosetta's law to protect the rights of teenage workers in the country. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair was published in 1906 and described the exploitation experienced by immigrant laborers in Chicago's meatpacking industry. And it sparked a public outcry into food hygiene. After reading it, President Theodore Roosevelt commissioned an investigation which led to a number of pieces of legislation and laid the groundwork for the FDA, which is still in existence today. And of course, in the field of uh, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, fiction has been incredibly important. H.G. Wells' The World Set Free, which was published in 1914, imagined the world war which would follow the emergence of artificial atomic energy. And physicist uh, Leo Sliard read the book in 1932 and was inspired to solve the problem of creating a nuclear chain reaction, and he went on to campaign for arms control. So art and creativity have immense potential to help us think about how technology might change the future and to even get ahead of some of the worst potential impacts of technological change. It can, of course, also reinforce stereotypes and create problematic discourses around technology. In the context of AI, some of these challenges arise uh, around the anthropomorphization of AI, as often occurs in film and TV. Uh, many anthropomorphized AIs are gendered and are frequently hypersexualized. So they either have exaggerated muscular bodies and aggressive tendencies like the Terminator or their conventionally beautiful female forms like Ava in Ex Machina. And this can result in the perpetuation of gender stereotypes 
um, which is something that we're already seeing in the technology itself. So voice assistants like Alexa, who historically are gendered as diminutive, subservient women, who to the accusation, you're a slut, answers, well, thanks for the feedback. So creative industries have a responsibility too to ensure that portrayals of AI aren't oversimplified or, or overly stereotypical. And at the same time to explore, in the words of the Barbican, what it means to be human when technology is changing everything. And this last example is particularly powerful for the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, because this year we surveyed 4,000 British people about facial recognition technology. And we found real concern about the tech um, and a feeling of inevitability about its rollout, but also a desire to see it being used in positive ways. And at ADA, we're working hard to influence the police, policymakers, and companies to slow down the rollout of facial recognition technology until there's a fit for purpose governance framework in place. In the meantime, initiatives such as Camouflage in the Digital Age are a great example of how art can inform public attitudes, government policy, and even practice. So my challenge to you over the next few days is to think about how the creative industries can help us move beyond uh, the Terminator and existing references to futures of technological change. I think we've reached the um, extent to which 1984 is a useful analogy anymore, and we need to think further about how to explore the ethical and social impacts of tech through art, through film, through fiction, through design and computing, um, and help also develop a more complex and nuanced public discussion that doesn't uh, revert to um, oversimplified uh, tropes. So thank you very much for having me and enjoy the conference. <laughs>